This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Kate Schellenbach on February 11th, 2018 in Los Angeles, California for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much, favorite drummer. Oh, thanks. Possibly of all time. Wow, that's, a, that's really nice. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we start at the very beginning. It's kind of like, this is your life. It's a personal and professional biography. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in the village, West Village in Manhattan, uh, New York City. Uh, what else can I tell you about okay. it? Uh, parents, do you have any siblings? I have an older sister who's three years older, and uh, my parents were together till I was about eight, and then they split up, uh, and I continued to live with my mom. Uh, we grew up mostly in the village. Uh, there was a year in Brooklyn, and then... A good part of my life was in a loft on 14th Street in Manhattan, which was pretty cool. And what was your uh, relationship like with your siblings, or where, where are you in the... I'm, I'm younger. I, my sister's three years older. Uh, I, our relationship growing up was contentious. I mean, you, you have like an older sibling, there's always a little bit of... Uh, I, I was like annoying to her because I was the younger one. And always sort of following in her footsteps but ultimately that was a good thing because she was like into music and she sang in the choir and all that kind of stuff so I'd sort of follow her um, and I think my first introduction to music was actually uh, she joined the choir we went to a school called St. Luke's which had a church you know choir that practiced every day and performed on Sundays and it was like sort of my introduction to being in a not a band but in a musical performance and rehearsing and all that kind of stuff so uh, but as we got in our teenage years, we became allies and friends and are very close. Um, before high school, um, what kind of kid were you? Were you like creative, shy, outgoing? Uh, I, what kind of kid was I? I was definitely a tomboy. Um, I, in elementary school, like I played sports with all the boys and all that kind of thing which was fine, and, and then uh, in middle school or junior high school, um, I went to a different school, a public school, and it was there I sort of found my crowd, which was uh, a lot of the, the neighborhood that I was going, grew up in, and the school that I was going to was, a lot of the kids had a similar family structure where the parents were like kind of artsy or artists or writers or creative or funky or weird, and uh, or divorced or whatever, it just seemed a little bit more, uh, less homogenous and uh, so, and intellectual and creative. And that's sort of where I found my group. Um, I guess I was always a creative child. Uh, I was always into drawing and art and that sort of thing and music and, uh, and uh, I guess sort of middle school years is when I found music as a real passion. But uh, I think I was, I, I don't know, I think I always tried to play cool, like I didn't, I wasn't particularly gregarious, uh, but I was always sort of just kind of cool and chill, I don't know, but funny. I guess that's how I just describe myself as a kid. Um, and your parents, they were both creative people? My mom was very musical, and um, she, in outside of work, yeah, she, she like played guitar, and she listened to music, it was all in the house all the time. Uh, my dad was sort of more intellectual. Uh, he wasn't particularly musical per se, but he was definitely somebody who read a lot and was like interested in culture and arts and knowledge and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and when, like you said, you were into drawing and art and stuff, was creativity something that was encouraged in your household? Like you grew up with your mom, so by your mom or... Uh, yeah, I think so, for sure. My mom, uh, we'd always be in, like, put in after-school classes, with, would it be at uh, pottery or arts or uh, woodworking, whatever, any, anything kind of thing to in inspire creativity, as well as piano lessons starting at age four and that kind of thing. And then, I, like I said earlier, uh, we joined the church choir, which was really... Um, like an introduction to music. And I think my mom even sang in the choir for a while. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that kind of music uh, was around us all the time, classical and uh, choral music. And uh, 
uh, that was definitely encouraged. We learned how to play piano and recorder and played my mom's guitar, like all kind, all that stuff. So everybody played recorder. Yeah, I think that was the thing. It's still a thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you said St. Luke's. Were you religious, Catholic? It was Luke's? Episcopalian, and uh, it, it was a small church in the village in New York, so it was very liberal. And of the Episcopalian churches, it was very super liberal and open. So uh, I did go to that school, and we had to go to church, and we went every, you know, I was even as a kid, I don't think I felt particularly religious, although I enjoyed the pomp and circumstance, enjoyed the holidays, uh, but I never could quite get on board with the, the whole story, the Christ story, but I, it, I enjoyed it. It was entertaining. I certainly loved Easter, uh, and I loved the music, and I loved all the stuff, but, uh, and the incense and all that, you know, like I said, the pomp and circus and the costumes and all that thing, uh, but uh, it wasn't, there wasn't really pressure on us to be religious um, it was just a kind of a nice small school, safe school, yeah. and pretty, pretty uh, campus and everything. Um, and what kind of music did you listen to when you were younger, or were you drawn to? Uh, well, in the house, my mom and dad, they play a lot of classical, but they'd also play, like my mom was into like Laura Nero and uh, LaBelle, and um, what else would she listen to, like... Peggy Lee and all kinds of just kind of cool like vocal music. Um, Beatles was big. Uh, so I think it, when I first sort of got interested in music was the Beatles. And then um, as I entered into like going to camp and going like away from home and l meeting people who were listening to stuff that uh, like B-52s and The Clash and Blondie and all that kind of thing, that's kind of where I first started to become obsessed with with music, was listening to that sort of late punk, early new wave stuff. And I don't want to um, skip ahead too far, but when were you introduced to the drums as a young person, or was that much later? It was no, it was well, it was uh, around thirteen or so, okay. uh, as a, as an instrument to play. You mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I first I started going to see live shows. Uh, when I was pretty young, like 13 or 14. And the first band I ever went to see live was at CBGB's. Uh, and there was a band called The Student Teachers. They were kind of great punk pop band, super young. And in fact, one of the girl, the girl who played drums in that band, uh, Laura Davis, she actually sang, had gone to St. Luke's for a second, she and her sister, and they sang in the choir. So it was kind of like, oh, she was in my choir. And she's only a couple years older than me. And um, they also had a girl play bass. Um, and so seeing those guys play, and they were, they were, they, they had some connection to Blondie, like Blond, uh, Jimmy Destry from Blondie was producing their, their singles. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this was kind of a perfect storm of like seeing a band and seeing women play music and uh, being connected to like one of my favorite band. Uh, it kind of put it in my head like, oh, I could be, I could be in a band. Like these kids are just a couple years older than us, same background. Uh, they they haven't been playing music very long, like, but they have a band. They're playing at CBGBs. Like this, maybe this is something I could do. <clears throat> so sh shortly after that, it was just one of those weird things. Like uh, I think I started playing on a, I don't even know. I borrowed a snare drum from a neighbor, and I was playing on like boxes and a snare drum, and my mom saw that I was interested. And uh, somebody she knew vaguely was going away for a year and asked if they could store their drum kit at our house. We had this huge loft. And my mom was like, yes, if my, my daughter can play on them and while, while, you, while, you, while we keep them, then for sure. So that's how I was able to play on a drum set for the first time. So I was about 13 or 14. Oh, wow. And, and then, your mom was, like, encouraging a few things. She was. And then she has this, like, mythology that I would play it to in the morning, which isn't true. Yeah. But we lived in this loft building, uh, which meant it was just, like, a, an old industrial space, which was kind of a big, unfinished area. But it had been used as a theater previously. So there was a part of the, um, the loft that had this soundproofing, this, like, really primitive, shitty soundproofing of, like, but there was a door that you could close that made one half of the house less loud than the other. <laughs> so the part where my mom was, I, I had to close the door and then the drums were on the other side. I mean, this still was loud as hell, but everybody in the building, we had a whole floor, so I didn't have neighbors on the other sides. And then there was a band upstairs from us that would practice like a rockabilly band. 
and there were below us friends of ours. It was the people were just very tolerant and very creative. It was, it was a very cool building. Um, there were artists and musicians and just people. There was a karate studio. It was this very weird New York situation. So it was very conducive to making, you know, learning how to play an instrument. Yeah. But uh, back then it was like, you know, it was also seeing, I think, uh, like a punk band or pop band or new wave that, that era. Uh, I was seeing people playing uh, music that wasn't particularly sophisticated. It didn't, you didn't seem like you had to know. It wasn't like watch, seeing Yes or Led Zeppelin or something. You're like, what the hell am I ever going to do that? So I would just put on records and play along to stuff, play along to my favorite things and just basically figure out how to play that uh, Gang of Four beat or whatever and just or The Clash or, or whoever and uh, B-52s and stuff is pretty simple. And then it was, you just play along and eventually figure it out and watch people. Did you ever have lessons or your- I did, I, I, uh, I was played for the first 10 years, I was self-taught and I just learned from listening and watching and, and just repetition. Uh, but then I got to a point where I kind of felt like very kind of stuck. And uh, I did get a teacher who was amazing and became like a real mentor. Um, which I could go into now if you want it, because oh, yeah, she was sure. a real... We can always go back. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so I guess about 10 years in, I had already played in, in a few bands, and I just felt like I had plateaued, and I wanted to be better. I wanted to be able to really play music styles uh, that I wasn't couldn't figure out, like uh, blues or jazz or country, that kind of stuff. And also, I think I was also having some physical issues from just repetition and not knowing the kinetics of of playing. And um, I, on the back of the Village Voice, where it used to have like ads for things, there was a, there was a ad for female drummers workshop. And it kind of caught my eye because I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to like do lessons, but a workshop sounds cool. That sounds like it's a bunch of people getting together. But it was actually, that was the name of this woman's uh, drum lesson thing. Uh, her name is Paula Spiro. And uh, I called her and we spoke for like an hour on the phone and she really just was like, asked me all about myself and my history and my pain and all this kind of thing. And she convinced me to come and see her for a lesson. And I ended up taking lessons with her for years and she just taught me everything about how to hold the stick. I was holding the sticks incorrectly, like just all the physical aspects of how, of drumming, which obviously is a very physical activity. So like, she's like, why do you have your cymbals up so high? No wonder your shoulder hurts. And I'm like, I don't know. That, that just, I'm just like, no one told me, you know, so, or uh, how to use the, uh, the mechanics of things bouncing, like all that kind of stuff. So it was uh, an amazing thing. And I, like I said, I saw her for years. She taught me how to read drum music. Uh, I'd learned how to read music a bit uh, in choir and playing piano and all that sort of thing. But, uh, and then ta- notation is similar. Uh, but then I was able to like, if I couldn't figure out something by listening to it, if it was charted out for me, I was like, oh, it's you know, follow the, follow the notes. Um, and also she just for confidence purposes, she's a woman who had been playing drums since the sixties and she was like a child prodigy and had dealt with all kinds of crazy sexism and madness through, and throughout the ages and just really had a great composure and great philosophy about drumming and music and hard work and all the things. So, uh, as I saw her, that's when I started playing in Luscious Jackson and that band started taking off. So she was able to sort of see me through the whole uh, arc of that, of that band as well. Yeah. She's an amazing person. She's someone to talk to for sure. I was in that. Yeah. I didn't want to be morbid, but I was like, is she still Yeah, with she's still with us. She's oh, still right. teaching and she's, oh, she's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. I'll tell, I'll give you information okay, later. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to go back a little yeah. bit. Um, what kind of student were you? Did you, like school? Were you interested in it? Did you not care? Uh, I was a kid. I think uh, I, I was good at things I was interested in. And then the rest of the time I figured out, I figured out how to do the least amount of work, but get the most, uh, I don't know how to, I, ma- I managed, I figured out how to get, get yeah. through school. Um, I, so I ended up going, I got into this uh, school called Stuyvesant, which is like an arts and math school. I'm sorry, it's a math and science school that you have to test into. It's like a very academic school. Um, and I went there for high school because I was, I don't know, it was closer, close to my house. And I got in and it seemed like a safe school to go to. It, didn't, there, it was very nerdy. Yeah. And a lot of people weren't getting beat up or mugged. It was just very, 
very like chill. Um, but it wasn't necessarily the greatest fit for me. Um, math and science weren't really my thing, but uh, I, I felt like the teachers got to know me and knew that I was creative and had this sort of other life going on. I was playing music already. And a lot of the teachers were sort of like, well, I'm going to have to fail you, but I know you'll be fine. So, <laughs> or I'll give you 65. So I was like sort of skated through high school, but managed to get into college. And then once I went to college, I was like studying the things I wanted to study and which was art and art history and that sort of thing. Um, so I think I've always been like tested, like tested well, um, intelligent, whatever uh, book, but uh, definitely like didn't do well in physics and like that kind of thing. I don't know. Who does? I, well, people at the school, yeah. <laughs> people at the school would get like, you know, 1600 on SATs. It was that kind of school, yeah. But I realized, I think I realized early on it didn't necessarily matter. In fact, in fact, I didn't, technically I didn't, because Stuyvesant was a math and science uh, school, the um, the things that you needed to graduate were a lot tougher than like the, the typical New York City public schools. So you had to take physics, you had to take advanced whatever, like all these things in order to get a Stuyvesant diploma. Um, I had, in my senior year, I'd already gotten to college, and um, but I had failed physics and they said, uh, well, we're not, you're not going to get a Stuyvesant diploma unless you take physics in, in college. And I was like, I'm already in college, and you're telling me I'm not going to get a high school diploma unless I take physics in college? That doesn't seem to make any sense. I've already, like, in there, like, uh, well, then we'll, you'll just get, like, a state diploma. I'm like, that's fine. I'm already in college. It doesn't matter. It clearly it doesn't matter. It's just all a farce. So it's that whole, like, permanent record thing. It doesn't really doesn't really exist. But anyway, I got, I got into college and yeah. graduated and all that. And you were already playing in bands while you were in high school? Yeah, I think um, I met the guys in the Beastie Boys. We were in a band before that called Young Aborigines. I was about 14 or 15. So about 15 probably is when I started playing with those guys. And then that band, uh, Young Aborigines, basically morphed into Beastie Boys. So that's 15, 16, 17 is when the Beastie Boys, when I was playing drums for them. Did you go to high school with them? No, I met those guys. Um, they all went to different schools. Uh, I um, met them. I started to go, go to see bands a lot. And uh, there was a group of kids from all over the city and all different boroughs that would go to the same, see the same shows. Um, Bad Brains was one of the bands. Stimulators was another band. And then we were all into like a lot of the English bands that would come over. So you'd see the same kids at the, sh at the same shows and the kids were all around the same age. Um, even though we were like 14, 15, 16, the drinking age in New York at the time was, was 18. So, and it, there was nobody checking IDs. Like they didn't, they didn't give a shit because they were just making money and they didn't care. Um, and also it, it didn't take that much to look 18, like even if, as a 15 year old, you just put some lipstick on or whatever eyeliner and you look 18, like it's, there's not a big difference, but no one, no one gave a shit anyway. Um, so, but, but the kids who were hanging out, we weren't, we weren't in a club, like, you know, drinking and trying to meet people, meet, you know, pick up people. We were just all like into the music. So we, a lot of like-minded kids would hang out outside the clubs and I met, uh, Mike Diamond and Adam Yelk outside a show. I don't even know what show it was. And then, um, actually, no, it wasn't Adam Yelk. It was Mike Diamond and, and John Barry. And those guys had this band called Young Aborigines. And they were rehearsing and they were like, and at the time I was really into the slits. So I had this sort of slits look going on and they were into the slits as well. Um, they invited me up to play percussion with their band and then eventually morphed into Beastie Boys. And I met Adam Yauch and the rest of those guys. Were there um, a lot of other like female dr drummers in the scene at the time? I know you mentioned the, the one band that you saw. Um, there were a lot of female musicians. I feel like drums was still pretty rare. Uh, but um, like the, the Raincoats had played in New York. They had a female drummer. Uh, but there was a lot of women in bands, like a lot of women guitarists and bassists and singers and, and uh, a lot of the bands that, that we were listening to had like prominent female uh, members. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of girls on the scene. So there's a lot of people my age, girls my age. Um, 
And that scene that we were in was very supportive and not sexist at all, at least our group of friends. Like, it was very, like, uh, like the boys that I met loved, loved the slits just as much as we did. And didn't, there was no, like, oh, they can't play because they're a girl. It was never that, which was awesome. And so I think that that, too, was a very encouraging scene to learn an instrument in. And um, I think the only time I really, like, experienced the sexist part of, of being a drummer was like going to the music stores up in the music area on 45th Street and going up to buy drumsticks or something and then having to deal with some meathead who's just like, mm, you play drums? Mm. You know, like that kind of thing. So that was lucky for me. That wasn't what I was experiencing with my peer group. That still happens today. Does it? <laughs> yeah. It's weird to me. Now I just like laugh because I don't care anymore. Yeah. It's so odd. I'm like, it's 2018 now. I find it really interesting because I follow, there's a, some drum companies I follow like on Instagram and there's so many female artists that they put up on their pages, which I think is very cool. It's very, you know, it doesn't, it's not just like, oh, there's that one drummer who's Sheila E. You yeah. know, it's like <laughs> all these women, the names of people are like, I don't know who that is, but that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, if you could just talk about uh, your college experience and kind of, I'm not sure if you graduated or I'm assuming you were like playing in bands and going to school at the same time. Yeah, like my high school years were a little bit more crazy. Like I was going playing in bands, I was going to clubs, I was like taking drugs, staying out all night, being wild and crazy, um, having a blast, like using the city like a playground. Um, and then by the time I went to college, I went to Hunter College, which is a city college in New York. Uh, I kind of chilled out and realized like, oh, school can actually be fun, like learning things and writing papers. Like if it's something that I'm really passionate about, like film or music or, or art or art history, this can actually be very stimulating and, and, and uh, rewarding. Uh, so it was, a, by the, and I did graduate, I had a BA, I was an art, a studio art major. Um, I, uh, by the time I graduated, like 21, 22, 21, I think, um, I was pretty done with the party aspect of like club land and all that shit. Um, and I started working and, and I just, I don't know. I, I was, I, after, after I'm like mixing things up, but, um, Beastie Boys, I was in until about 17. And then they started, we, their, our last music we, I did with them, we did sort of like a proto-rap thing called Cookie Puss, which was very weird. It was like a prank phone call uh, laid over a, like a disco beat. And um, we were still doing punk music, but still playing this, uh, also trying to figure out how to play this. And uh, we had to play show, we were, this song was getting played on like college radio in different places, New York and Boston and Detroit, and all these sort of major cities. And um, people were wanting us to play shows, but we had to figure out how we were going to play this sort of different kind of song. So the boys had met Rick Rubin. Um, he was a kid who went to NYU, and they, he could be our DJ. So we hooked up with Rick, and this is how the boys, we all met uh, Rick Rubin, and he was starting uh, Def Jam out of his college dorm and all this stuff. Whole other story. Um, but uh, <clears throat> we put together a, like a rap set. So we'd play all our punk rock stuff and then we'd switch gears, Rick would DJ, and we would we all wrote raps and we did this whole rap. And I think I must have performed this like three or four times. It was not for me. Like the boys were all really good at it. It was just wasn't, I just liked being behind the scenes. I like playing drums. I didn't particularly want to be like a front person and I certainly wasn't good at writing raps. And those guys were like somehow just magically genius at it. Um, so um, after they basically Rick, to convince the guys that they had a future as like the first white rap group, but he didn't like me. He didn't like girls rapping. He didn't want me to be involved. So it was kind of, they were kind of like, it was either him or me. Um, so that was brought to me. I was like about 17. Uh, and they uh, informed me that it was, they were going to like go with Rick, but we could still play music together under a different name. So that's what happened for a while. It was like playing music with, um, with the, with the, uh, with the BCs, but under like a punk rock band, different name. And then they were continuing on making this rap album, which is like, became licensed to ill. Um, but it was really, it was a big bummer. They basically, they ended up 
becoming, you know, the did License to Ill became huge, and it was, I was really bummed out. I was kind of like turned off from music for a while. Um, so it wasn't until like after college when I kind of came back around and got interested in playing in bands again. There was like a little bit of a time where I was sort of I like. I don't like Rick Rubin. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, I mean, it seems like it sort of happened for a reason if you weren't happy like playing that kind of Yeah, thing. it wasn't, I was never, you know, people were like get mad about it. I'm like, yeah, but it became a different band. It wasn't really, it wasn't for me. You know, Why didn't he like you though? Well, we just didn't get along because he was a meathead and he was kind of a, he, uh, I don't think he, he is anymore. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen him in a million years. But at the time, he was like kind of into putting on this persona of being like a sexist dickhead, meathead. And um, the, uh, it just rubbed me the wrong way as it, as it would, as it should. And I never had anyone judging me as, uh, as a woman. Like it never, that was never a thing. Like, I don't like how you sound because you're a woman. I mean, I can hear you like, I, I don't like how you sound because you just suck, which which was really the case, but uh, he had like literally said, I don't like the sound of female rappers. I was like, I don't, I mean, there were some at the time. Yeah. We were all really into rap and, and uh, early rap days and Sugar Hill Gang and that whole world. And so there were just, you, you they were straying from the like live yeah. things. Well, we would play, like I said, we'd like half the set would be us uh, playing our regular old punk rock set and then we'd switch gears and do this rap thing and it was just, Whatever. It wasn't for me. Yeah. Okay. I never knew about yeah. him, so I don't hate him, but I will <laughs> say I'm disappointed. I mean, you know, I also will say he was only like two years older than us. It's not like yeah. he was some Spengali. He was just like a college kid who who was very ambitious and obviously did very well for himself. It's like not obviously he knew what he was talking about. And, um, you know, the BC Boys, that first record... Uh, which I find hysterical. Like I think it, I think of it as like a comedy record because it really is just them putting on this persona as like spring break meatheads. Like that's not who they were. They were just sort of like playing this, um, you know, fucking with a wiffle ball bat. That's not that's not where these kids were coming from. But uh, that uh, then they moved away from that. Like they that was just sort of like a whole put on for the masses. Um, and even Rick, I think is. I don't know, he's like a Buddhist guy now, so I don't know. Yeah, that happens. That seems to be Yeah, everybody grows up. Like when you're like 17, 18, 19, 20, you're just trying on personas and figuring out what sticks and what yeah. does well for you. But Well, Rick Rubin should apologize. <laughs> One day. <laughs> um. Some, weirdly, I haven't ever crossed paths with him, and especially in the business that I'm in, it's shocking, but I don't care. I don't... Well, oh. maybe he'll apologize to you now yeah. when he sees this, right. which he will because this is a very huge and well-known. I'm sure. I'm sure I can. Oh, I'm sure I owe him some apologies too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you said that that was that was like kind of difficult when that record blew up, I guess. And so in yeah. college, you weren't really playing, and you. Yeah, it's like post. A little bit, I guess uh, I can't have to think it the year-wise when that album came out. It must have been uh, towards the end of my college days. Yeah. Um, I have to look up when that record came out, but uh, I was psyched for them because they were my friends. A lot, but I had they were also uh, they were like my really good friends. I mean, we were like close, people, but I kind of lost them for a while. Uh, and um, it took yeah, it took a while to sort of be invigorated by music again, and free, and like go out like t t uh, like I would go out to clubs just to dance or whatever, um, and it wasn't going out to see bands. But then it kind of switched a little bit. Um, I think actually the band that I saw that kind of made me excited again was the Luna Chicks. You know that band? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you drum with them for a while? I did for a, for a second. So I saw them again. What the fuck year was that? Maybe 91 or something. And, um, or 90, 91. Then, and they're all girl punk band, New York. And also hysterical. And I realized there was like a through line of like, I love like the com combination of like good humor and music. It just really works for me. So I felt like the BC Boys were like kind of a comedy band and Lunatics too, to me were sort of a comedy band, uh, but great and incredible musicians and badass and funny and dress up and all this stuff. And I started to see them and I was like, oh my God, there's this whole incredible fun, uh, funny punk rock movement going on in, at the same old clubs at like CBGB's and all these places downtown. So yeah. I, Got to, got to know those girls and then played with them for like a tour. I did a tour with them, which was awesome, really fun.
Was that your kind of introduction back into music? Like, was that? The first I think so. I, I no, I had played in I had played in a couple of bands. Uh, I played in a band called Hagatha for a while. I played in just a few different things, uh, and would gig still around. But it wasn't anything. I was. It wasn't really like my thing. It was just more more of like I want to say a hired hand, but it wasn't. I wasn't necessarily as passionate. Um, but uh, around the same time I saw the Luna Chicks, I had reconnected with uh, Jill and Gabby, who were, are the main songwriters in Luscious Jackson. And uh, they had been living in San Francisco and they had done a, a demo tape. Um, and they uh, gave their demo, ta demo tape to Mike Diamond of the Beastie Boys just to get like notes. And uh, at the time the Beasties were just uh, thinking about starting their own record label. And they really liked this. Uh, demo tape and they were like we'll, we'll put it out on our label um, and I guess other people they had given this demo tape to had said well you'll have to re-record it and like blah, blah, blah. and Mike was like no it's perfect the way it is you just need to add some more songs and they were also had an offer to play out live so then they decided to put a band together that's how uh, they contacted me and Vivian Trimble who's the keyboardist at the time uh, so it was all around that, that same time like 90, 90 91, 92 and uh uh, I was playing with the Loon Chicks, and I toured with them, and I was playing with Luscious Jackson. They were, we were getting our first tour. Um, when had you, you said you reconnected with Jill and Gabby. When had you met oh, them yeah. originally? Oh, I, I met the, so Jill and Gabby were also part of the scene of kids who were going to see shows. Um, Jill actually went to St. Luke's for a second as well, but uh, we went to, I mean, I know, I've known Jill since we were like three. We went to the, we grew up in the village, and we went to the same dance class in like, we just crossed paths over the years. Um, and Gabby, she lived on, the, on uh, the Lower East Side and went to different schools, but we'd met like on St. Mark's Place, hanging out at, in front of the record store, like that kind of thing. Um, and Jill and Gabby, they went to San Francisco and they were roommates and uh, like I said, started making music together, you know, working as waitresses and making music and using their tip money to make a demo and all that kind of thing. Um, but then they moved back to New York, and that's yeah, that's how we reconnected. And um, so, you were you working like real job? You graduated with the art degree. I yeah, I worked so pretty soon after college. I got a job at a photo archive as a photo researcher, and my hours were was it three p.m. to midnight. So it was pretty conducive to like a rock and roll lifestyle. Uh, and then also it was like after five or six, everyone was gone. I was, it was just me and, and somebody working in the dark room. So I could use the Xerox machine to make flyers or like, you know, whatever. Like it was a very, you know, use the postage machine to uh, send out invitations or whatever. It was like really like the perfect job for someone who's like playing music and being in the band and all that kind of thing. Um, so I worked, yeah, I worked at a photo archive and worked there for, for like five years and uh, not at that night, not the night shift, but eventually because I was a head researcher and it was a pretty cool job. Um, and then when Luscious Jackson, I had taken one like leave of absence to do a tour. And then when another tour came along, they were just like, I think we'll just accept your resigna resignation. <laughs> I was like, okay. So yeah, there was a time, you know, the early days of Luscious Jackson touring and like sleeping on people's floors and all that kind of thing. And uh, not knowing if I made the right decision, but Pretty soon we were able to make a living, so that was that was good. Um, yeah, I mean, if you could kind of, I know it's a lot, but if you could talk about Luscious Jackson's kind of, you talked a little bit about the beginnings, but then your, the trajectory mm -hmm. to success, you know, in the 90s. So, yeah, the, uh, Luscious got together. Yeah, it was a, I guess their demo, they maybe made it in 91. And we were finished it out, we filled out this EP uh, with some live songs, meaning uh, songs that were made on instruments rather than samples, which is what they were doing. Uh, when Jill and Gabby, when I first heard their demo tape, I was really struck by, um, they were using samples and loops and beats and stuff, and then singing and rapping. But like the samples they were using are like really obscure, like punk songs or like things that we all grew up with. And I was like, oh, that's Honey Bane. Like I recognize that loop, um, but it was really cool and fun and playful and musical and it just really spoke to me kind of like same like the Beastie Boys it was like oh we all have the same references musically and and uh hu humor references and cultural references uh so this was just like another aspect of that 
Um, but when Jill called me, she said uh, to, to join. She's like, do you want to? And we actually, we had been jamming together just in other, just for fun. Um, but she's like, oh, Luscious Jackson's like, we're like an ESG cover band. And I don't know if you've ever heard of ESG. There's a band, there's a very cool band. Uh, there are three sisters. I believe they're from the Bronx. And their mom, the, the legend goes they, uh, that their mom bought them all instruments. And ESG stands for Emerald, Sapphire, Gold. It's all their birthstones. And um, they would play, they were playing in like 80s club land. They'd come down and play like the downtown clubs. They had a, a, a record that was put out. It's like one of the most sampled records in the world. And uh, this song called Moody. And they'd play these downtown clubs. And it was this like total minimalist funk. And it was a girl, actually a girl drummer in that band bass player, percussionist, singer, and it was like the most minimalist, most awesome, most danceable stuff. And they were also a band that I saw that was just like, this is so cool. So Jill said, you want to start an ESG cover band kind of as a joke. And I was like, oh yeah, definitely. That's, that, that would be great. So uh, the combination of hearing their demo tape and then her sort of approach of what the live band would be like, um, sort of dance and pop, but smart and funky and, uh, original and feminist was cool. Uh, so we started, uh, we, uh, um, the Beasties had a label called Grand Royal that they started. We were their first release. Uh, Grand Royal was quickly signed to Capital, which was the label the Beasties were on. So it was like a, what do you call that? Like a boutique label, I guess, that Capital was, was um, distributing, which is great because for an independent label to actually get distribution, it, it's nice to have like the, the big label dealing with a lot of shit. And then I also had the support of the label as far as uh, monetary support for doing videos and uh, press and all that kind of thing. Uh, so about 93 is I guess when we started touring and we got, we uh, did, um, we toured, we started touring around the country and we opened for a band called Betty Severt. And then we got an opening slot with the Breeders, which was huge, as you can imagine, like that, that um, when they released uh, Last Splash, it was like huge, huge, huge. Um, we did uh, Lollapalooza, and then we did Lilith Fair. Like we, I think we're the only band who did both Lollapalooza and Lilith Fair, which I think is a cool thing to, to say. Uh, but we toured with R.E.M., we opened for them for months. We had toured with this, that band live. Uh, we all did our own headlining tours. We brought the Lunatics on tour. Like we just, you know, typical rock and roll. Started in a in a van, worked our way up to an RV. Eventually, we're like our last years of touring. We're in a tour bus. You know, just it was nice. It was fun. And then uh, <clears throat> we put out uh, one EP and three full length albums on Capitol. By the time we released our last album, it's called Electric Honey. It was in 1999. There had been, it was sort of like a sea change in, in music at the time, and it was sort of like the post-Lilith Lilith Fair uh, backlash is how I look at it. So there was a time where you heard a lot of fem female uh, voices on the radio, and it became this time where it was this sort of got very macho, and it was and not, not only female voices, but then more funky stuff like Beck, you know, that all this stuff was getting pushed out, and it became this sort of macho time. It was this like Limp Biscuit and Corn and all this kind of heavy shit and like like meathead shit. So um, Capitol Records had gone through a, a personnel change and the people who were who had been championing us throughout the years left or were fired or whatever. Uh, so they kind of were left with us and didn't quite know how to market us. And they basically were like, we're gonna stop working this record. Um, you know, all the radio stations were like, well, we're, we already have, we're already playing uh, Garbage, so we can't play Luscious Jackson. It was like that kind of thing. You know, we already have our late or our lady group, or or we're playing No Doubt, so we can't play you. It's like that kind of. That's how fucked up it was. Um, and we had been touring. You know, this is already like eight or eighth year and touring, and like everyone's like no one can maintain relationships, and everyone's tired. And it was you know basically Jill was like, I want to, I I'm I want to be with my husband. I want to have kids. Like I want to get off the road. So we pulled the plug. Basically, like 2000s when we stopped. And um, it was a bummer, you know, it took a, it, I didn't necessarily want to stop, but, you know, I had to respect that people weren't happy and it, it was hard to make a living and, you know, it's just, I, I think, you know, the music business, like everything just goes through, through these waves and the wave was not in our favor at that time. So um, I think it's changed, you know, right now I think it's better for women, but 
uh, I don't know. It's that's just, really interesting. Um, well, that's a, a common theme, and everyone who worked in the '90s brings up the Limp Bizkit. What happened in the late '90s? Yeah, the Woodstock the like, rape, rape in the mosh pit. Uh, yes. Yeah. Era. But <laughs> what I what I haven't heard before is the you know the only room for one woman band in the 90s that's something that comes up a lot in the 80s like with the hair metal you can only have one I did I did not know that I I think but yeah towards the end of the era I mean there had been time there was a time and you know Lush Jackson was like kind of a funny band because we were lumped into the alternative rock world world that we were a little bit more and we weren't certainly weren't rap and we you know uh but we were more we were pop we thought I don't know alternative pop I guess um but the stations, there was like all these stations around that t- sort of mid '90s. Uh, there had been this whole subgenre of stations that were playing like women or women alternative rock. So, um, you know, everything from Hold to Garbage to uh, all the female singer songwriters, and and uh, that all went away pretty quickly. I think like by the time that fucking Woodstock thing. We had done Lilith Fair with, uh, it was, Lilith Fair was incredible. We did like two years of that and got to meet like so many incredible people. And one of the people that was on Lilith Fair at the, at the second, second year we did it was uh, Shell Crow. And she had played, I want to say she played Woodstock that, I think which was 98 or 99. And she reported back and was just like, this was the horror. It was like people were literally getting like groped and fucked in the, in like mud pits and stuff. It was just like awful. And we're like, oh, this is not good. Like, it just felt like this isn't good. Um, and even Cheryl Crow, I feel like, like that uh, adult alternative, I don't know what you call that. Yeah, uh, yeah whatever, whatever her genre is. Alternative is good. I feel like she even had to, like, find her own, like, a different place into the business, which maybe is more country-oriented. But, um, yeah, there was, a, like, dark times in that, that late 90s, early aughts for women. In the, on the radio and elsewhere. But it, I think it, it turned eventually. Yeah, I mean, I'm just sick of, like, I don't understand why it has to be cyclical. Yeah. <laughs> why, like, you get a little chunk of time and then... Oh, and then I don't know. I mean, maybe... Th- I th- also, the music industry hadn't quite gotten... It was it was starting to... The, like, Napster and all that kind of shit was just starting to tinkle in. So it wasn't quite in, the, in dire straits as it became. And um, I don't... People even ripping CDs at that time, but I, 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 we didn't we didn't get that part of it. So I think things got really f- fucked up. But I actually think the internet made it possible for like obviously so many different kinds of mu- bands and music and people from bumfuck nowhere to to find an audience. Um, and uh, you know we didn't we didn't come up in that time. So uh, we self released an album uh, a few years ago, and it was a through Pledge Music, so it was a crowdfunded, you know, we used that whole model, um, and it was all digitally released. Uh, we did actually print, uh, we did make CDs, but I don't know. It's, it, the whole, I, I, I'm happy not to be in the music business presently. I don't even understand. You'd have to tour all the time, I guess, to make money. Um, well, can I just ask, at, at the height of your fame, like with the, with the debut album, um, were you able to make a living then? Like when things were good, you could do that? I Yeah, I guess we released uh, by the... Uh, our th- second album was an album that had uh, the song uh, Naked Eye on it, which was our only song that we charted on, or charted with. And uh, by that time we were touring, we were able to pay ourselves a salary. We ultimately are still in debt to our, like our publishing company and all that stuff, but we were making enough money on tour and merchandise and uh, with advance, like publishing advance to pay ourselves a pretty, you know, a nice salary, but we weren't like, you know, living like, living large or anything. We all still still live in our shitty little apartments in New York and that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a point, we, were, we had a few side music- musicians touring with us and at some point we were like, they're making more money than we are because we're paying them salaries and then per diem and all that stuff. And we're just like, ugh, there's like no way to make, you basically, you have to sell a million record, records in order to make money off of that. And we weren't necessarily a band who, we toured and we had, 
but we weren't like a band that would tour for a year. We'd tour for a month and then take some time to regroup and then tour. We weren't like road dogs. So I think that's, that doesn't, you know, it works against you trying to make a living because you do, you sell merchandise and that's like, that's a way to make money. So. Um, and what were some of the pros and cons at that time period of like being a really successful band? That that was also a time when, you know, the nineties was like a really good decade for women in music. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I remember like I had all of your pictures on my wall Mm -hmm. and stuff, like you were very visible. Um, but what, but what was that like, especially being a drummer and you're kind of in the back and then you're like making music videos and you're on the cover of magazines and you're doing interviews and people are staring at you all the time? I think, well, for us, I think we had a pretty, from the get-go, we were very in charge of our uh, marketing and our imagery and our, uh, we, we produced all our albums, co-produced them all. We uh, decided on all our artwork and our photo shoots and clothes and videos and we approved all video concepts and everything about it so we were pretty much um and because we were on uh grand royal and on the beastie boys record label they also were doing the same thing i mean the beastie boys used their advance money to buy to create their own studio and record all their albums themselves you know like they they were very much and they would make their own videos and direct their own videos and like we definitely we were using their model of how to succeed in this business and how to keep track and especially I think as women it's super important because we would watch other bands uh, who'd be marketed in this like very sexual way and it just worked against them because then they'd play these shows and people would be yelling take off your shirt and like let's show us your tits and And that didn't happen to us we were like able to sort of um, I guess give off an image and maybe you could speak to this better than I that that we were like in control and in charge and like self-assured and weren't having to like bare skin in order to sell ourselves um and, and like our first record, there, there, there wasn't a picture of us on the cover. Um, I don't think I don't think there was a picture of us on the cover until the third record. So um, it was very important for us to sort of maintain that control. And there were times, you know, there was a time in you know your people were asking us to do like magazine fashion shoots and that kind of thing, and you'd have these stylists who were trying to put us in like sexy Versace and like that kind of stuff, and we're just like no. This is sorry, not for us. And we were pretty just, I don't know, headstrong or naive about the whole thing. And uh, perhaps we would have been that much bigger, but it just, it didn't, it was just never, that was just never going to be us. So I felt like we uh, were able to deal with, and our our sort of rise in popularity, um, it took like by the third album is when we charted. And even that was like, I don't know, maybe it was number 24 on the, Hot 100, like I don't even know. We never got like a number. We weren't like huge, huge, huge where it was unbearable. Um, and then um, we also we were really sure to try to like pick tours and and uh, strategize about where we were playing and having days off, just like in order to maintain sort of mental health, which is really hard. And I'm, anybody who tours will tell you like being on the road, you can understand why everyone becomes like drunks and drug addicts because it's just you're tired, you're hungry. You're, you're not where you want to be. Someone else is in control of every aspect of your comfort and your well-being. And uh, there's this, like, that hour, hour and a half a day where you're, like, doing your job and the rest of the time you're just sort of like, ah. Um, so we try to, you know, try to have as much fun as we could and be, stay creative. Uh, but I think we had it, we had it, we had it, like, we, we did come out in a good time. I think the 90s were great. Uh, I think um, being connected to the, to the Beastie Boys was a really was a blessing, and being on their label and and being having allies that understood where we were coming from, and and uh, we actually toured with them, which was not great because anybody who opens for the Beastie Boys is like a horrible slot to be in because nobody wants to see anybody with the Beastie Boys. So, um, but uh, you know, they they were it was it was really fun. I can imagine the crowd. Like to see oh yeah, boys they're just like these day boys. <laughs> <laughs> but but that being said, uh, it also the people who are really into the Beastie Boys were interested in everything that they did. So that the fact that we were on their label was was definitely got us a lot of eyes. So there were people who were like, oh, uh, these are like handpicked by the Beastie Boys. So we're gonna check them out. And that so that so was all great. Our college bros listening to uh-huh. Precious Jackson. <laughs> well, once they got past the bro phase and got more into like the weird stoner like sample yeah. phase. But uh, I mean, we 
I was thinking about, because I was thinking about, um, like, you know, doing Lilith Fair with, like, Bonnie Raitt and Emmylou Harris, and, like, all these incredible female musicians, uh, uh, Chrissy Hine and uh, Sarah McLaughlin, just all these people are just, like, so incredible and creative and amazing, and just being able to be exposed and hang out and jam with all of these people, and, you know, it was very, very cool. Um, so it sounds like you had kind of, like, two major moments of, like, disillusionment in your musical life, when the Beastie mm. Boys thing happened, and then when Luscious Jackson decided to call it quits for a while, but uh -huh. then you did something else. Um, but at, at any point, had you, like, decided that you were going to make music a career, and how difficult was that for you to sort of, like, realign yourself after the Luscious Jackson break? Um, yeah, I think, I, you know, when I quit my job, it was probably, like, 93, uh, my, my day job at the photo agency, um, that was a big, like, I guess I'm doing this, I guess I'm going to think I can make a living doing this, and I had always done music as a hobby. It never had taken it very seriously. But I think part of that was just so I didn't have to put the pressure on myself to like, I'm a musician. But uh, and that's part of, I think, what the drum teacher I went to helped me realize. She was like, you're a musician. You're a professional musician. You're, you, you've played tens of thousands of hours. Like, this is, this is who you are. And I was like, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. That's great. So yeah, when, so when the band split up, um, I think uh, initially, I was sort of lost, didn't quite know what to do. I didn't think I wanted to be in a band because it was such hard work and all the touring. I, like, it just didn't, I it just wasn't, I wasn't up for it. You know, a band, people say it's like a marriage, but you're married to like several people. And it's just, and I always like to equate it to be working in an office, but then you never leave the office and you all like, the office then gets on wheels and travels to the next city. And it's just like, it's, it's very like, uh um, so I was like enjoying not doing that. So I was playing drums for people and recording and just sitting in with people and um, trying, you know, just try to keep my chops up as a musician. Um, and it took a few years to find a different career. And I, I was living in New York. I started dating something, some, something. I started something. dating, some, <laughs> I started dating someone in LA. So I started coming out to LA more and more. And then I eventually moved out here. And uh through a variety of different people and things, I managed, I started working at the Ellen DeGeneres show as, as a researcher, and then I started the second career as a, uh, or whatever, third career, as a TV producer, talk show producer. So that's what I've done for the last 15 years. But um, yeah, it took a few years to be like, who am I, what am I, I mean, I think, I feel really lucky, like all the things I learned on the road and putting, being in a band that produced themselves and put on shows. And I was very much involved in all of the day-to-day uh, -day scheduling and touring schedules and all this kind of thing. And uh, that gave me like a producer's brain, which I was able to transfer over to television production mm -hmm. and uh, realize like, oh yeah, now I've done, I've done interviews. On, I've been the person being interviewed and now I interview people for a living. Like I kind of know how that works. and. Uh, I think for a lot of people who are musicians who are trying to tr transition into the next career, you know, a lot of the success depends on, did you get hooked on drugs? And were you paying attention while you were playing all these shows at what was going on? Because you could learn, it, it's kind of an amazing thing to put on a show in a different city every night and p pull it off. So uh, I was able to parlay all that info into a different career, which is cool. How... Were you playing music at, at all once you started, like even just for fun, when you started doing television Tele production? Yeah, like I still play, I still have a kit, and uh, I wasn't, I, was, I have like a cover band that I play, play with, with for fun, which we do like 80s weird covers and stuff with friends. Um, and this band's called Push Buttons, and we, you know, we, it's all people who played music uh, either professionally or on a high level in like the 90s, and now are just like, have kids and families and jobs. So uh, I still, like for me, drumming and playing music is still like, if I don't do it uh, often enough, it's like I can feel my soul just like shriveling up. So it's like I need, I can feel like, oh, I gotta, I gotta play the drums. So, you know, I have a kit set up at home and I can listen and play along to like 
whatever. And it's, it's great. And I get to you know, play with people, not as much as I'd like, but, um, and then Luscious Jackson, we put out an album a couple of years ago and we'll, we'll play shows, you know, every once in a while we'll, we'll get together and play some shows. If you could play again, that would be great because I missed the New York one. I couldn't make it. Yeah. That was depressing. We're trying to, <laughs> we're, we played Brooklyn the last two shows, uh, because the rest of the girls uh, live in Brooklyn, and we, uh, our DJ too, lives out in uh, New York. Um, hopefully, we have, we'll play some more. They're tr we're trying to figure out how to play out here. Hopefully, you live on the East Coast. I do stuff out here too. Yeah. I'd come out here to see All right, you. we'll let you know. Schedule yeah, something. it's. Yeah, let me East Coast. Just putting out, but basically, like being in a band and putting on a one off show and trying to play, you know, as Luscious Jackson and then play. Uh, the show that people want to see that, and uh, like our band, uh, because we use a lot of loops and, and, um, uh, samples and that kind of thing, there's a lot going on in our recorded music, uh, sonically. So it can't necessarily be pulled off with just like bass, drums, guitar, vocals. Like we have, when we tour, we have a percussionist, we have someone triggering samples. We have a DJ who's filling in all the, the weird stuff. And, um, there's several layers of vocals. So it's like, how you can put on a show that's like up to snuff for people to pay their 25 bucks or whatever to see you. It's like kind of like we, we, we played some shows that have been amazing and really fun. Um, but it's, uh, it takes a lot. <laughs> we need like, we have like three side musicians that we have to kind of come on board and rehearse and all that, but it's super fun. It's like when we played, I think when we play now, um, we're playing for people who are like old fans, but then also people who were maybe too young to see us back in the day when we first were out or they knew us, they found us through MTV when they were in high school and they never got to see us or whatever, or through like Pete and Pete or like random television shows that we did. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's super fun to play. And you know, but, but that being said, we weren't like as big as like Hole or somebody who could, they could actually do a tour and make money and play, you know, do like a stint in Vegas or something like we we were never that big in order to, to be able to do that. So. so I didn't know that when I was younger. Like <laughs> if you if your picture was on my wall, I was just, it's it's just funny yeah. being 14, 15 and listening to all of you or you'd all be in the same article. I'm like all of these bands are, are the same level of right. famous. Right. Yeah. Everyone's rich and touring <laughs> and happy. <Yeah. laughs> like, um, Everyone's getting their free converse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did want to ask you one thing, because you mentioned when you had decided to call it quits in 99, um, that, that Jill had said, you know, like, I want to be with my husband at home, maybe have kids, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and that that was kind of a universal feeling among the, the bandmates. Do you, so I sometimes ask this, ask this question because I, but I know that it's like a gendered question. Mm -hmm. But how difficult is it to to kind of like maintain, like you said, personal relationships as a woman while being a working touring musician? And like, if it is harder for women, why do you think that is? I, I don't know if it's harder for men or women. I think it's hard in general to maintain a relationship in a job that you're away from home for periods of times. And, um, I think, uh, that's just, I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter what you're doing and I don't think it matters if you're a man or a woman. I think it's just being away from home in an environment where you're just like all encompassing or super bored is not like a great thing for a relation for someone who's at home, um, or for that relationship to maintain over time. Uh, I think, you know, Bef like we were touring and it was kind of like cell phones were just starting to happen. It was like by the end, we actually all had cell phones that made touring a lot better. Um, but at the, if you can imagine like being away for weeks at a time and just like having to pull over at a, at a, at a pay phone to call your partner or whatever. Uh, I don't know that anybody had very successful relationships in the band while we were touring. And, I, and um, Jill was like the most motivated to get off the road. I can't remember if she was married by the time we split, but uh, she must have been because then she quickly was started having kids. And then um, shortly after that, both Gabby and I and, and Vivian as well, who had left the band previously because she also couldn't deal with the touring part of it. Um, 
but like I, like I said, I don't I don't know if it's a if it's a gender thing. I think it's it's a tough lifestyle for for anybody. Uh, and like you know, we toured with like REM, and a huge band was able to tour like with multiple tour buses, and they bring you know the guys who had, were married, they brought their wife wives on tour with their like children and like they were able if you can do that that's ideal uh but um i think once you start having kids uh, you know and yeah maybe it's maybe when you're the mom that's a whole other level i can't even imagine how we would have toured with little babies like that doesn't seem possible but i guess people do it you have to be very successful to do it though i'm guessing yeah you have to be rem yeah <laughs> peter Basically. buck yeah um uh, oh, okay. We don't have to talk about this. If you don't want to, I'll just cut it out. Um, and I don't remember... It's funny that I don't remember this happening when I was younger. I missed it. I, w I would always... Like I told Patty, I would always try to find... Like as a little closeted lesbian, I would always mm -hmm. try to find like other... Like maybe that maybe that person's like the lesbian in that band. And uh -huh. like... Patty, I knew it because it takes one to know one. Right, right, right. Before she came out in Rolling Stone. The gaydar. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then I would just sit and, like, watch 120 minutes and, and like, pray that <laughs> some of these, like, women in the bands that I liked were gay. Um, but you but you came out in a, in a in the advocate. Is that true? Or were uh, you, like, publicly out? I don't, think I, I don't think I necessarily came out in anything per se. I don't, like, it wasn't, like, a, a planned announcement that I, yeah. I think... Uh, in that particular, I did an uh, interview with um, Josephine Wiggs, who from the Breeders, who I was dating. I dated for a few years. Mm -hmm. We dated each other. Um, I think that was her. Maybe, oh, she might have come out somewhere else. I don't remember. But I think for both, well, for me, uh, I was always out. It was never a thing. Um, when we did interviews, it, we talked about each other very uh, transparently about relationships. And, um, you know, sometimes people think everyone in the band was gay and everyone was like, whatever. <laughs> Um, I was the only gay person in the band, uh, besides like side musicians, but, um, uh, so yeah, it was just, we, again, I don't know if it was New York and just the scene that we were in, it was always very, it was a non-issue and no one gave a shit. I think when we toured with the Breeders, actually, um, I was like such a huge fan of theirs and I didn't, and Josephine wasn't out. But uh, we did this tour with them. I was kind of like, hmm, hmm, yeah, it takes one to know. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And then we finally like got the skinny on her, and and then we ended up dating um, by the end of that tour. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's exciting when you find like Patty or whatever. Um, but I think the alternative world, you know, even like at the highest levels, like you have Kurt Cobain who was like singing about how he's gay, and you know, all these great people, champions of of uh, alternative lifestyles or whatever. Um, so it was never never a big thing for me. I didn't really, I, you know, I feel like the other girls in the band, they probably had to deal with more homophobia than I did because it, the people were like, oh, you're a bunch of lesbians. And they were like, yeah, well, okay, whatever. We're not, but okay. Yeah, so, yeah. but. Uh, I just, yeah, I, mean, I just didn't know if it was, um, it's, it seems to be like, like a generational kind of thing too where when I interview younger people it's like very important that they're out but then sometime but uh I don't know how, I always say the wrong thing and then I'm like more ma more mature women mm -hmm. from earlier decades that isn't that isn't something that was like such an important part of of their whole identity or something I yeah, well, it's even generational between, like, me and, like, the generation older than me. Yeah. Um, there's, like, people I've met who are huge rock stars who are not comfortable with saying that they're gay and being out. And uh, it's just because it's just a different generation, and you have to kind of be like, okay, everybody knows, but okay. Uh, so, but, you know, I feel like it's such an individual thing, and I am I feel very blessed that I grew up in New York and grew up in a time where, like, my my uh, my gender and my sexuality and all that stuff was not an issue, and it was just made that was something interesting about me. Mm. Um, so I feel like I'm very I don't have a very typical story as far as that goes. I grew up in a very liberal household. My sister's gay. My mom's gay. Uh, so it's like your sister's gay too. Yeah. So uh, my mom wasn't out for a million years, and then 
uh, you know, just a different generation. Uh, so I learned to kind of disrespect everyone's story. But uh, yeah, did I, I don't know. I don't know if there was a coming out necessarily. I think it was just always was. And I obviously, I don't know, you just take a look at me. It's like, duh. <laughs> I had no idea. No idea, ever. Um, I told Patty the other day, I was like, no, I was like, nobody knows when they look at me. She goes, you're kidding. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, Patty Schemmel can tell. I was like, that's all I mean. I don't care if anyone else. I like, I like <laughs> spotting like the little, uh, you know, in my business, which I do a lot of celebrity interviews and I'm like seeing the little young, younger actors. And I'm like, yeah. Cut, cut to three years later, you'll be coming out on whatever. So, on Ellen, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm pretty good gaydar. I think I've predicted a few. And I've got, we have some coming up. Okay. TBD. I'll just email you. Know, if I ever have yeah. a question, I'll be like, what do you think about this person? Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> no, um, but I think it's, it's, it's great. I mean, the, it's, so, it's so interesting now how everything has become so hyper-politicized again uh, talk about waves, like we're in like a very, like obviously strong uh, uh, feminist wave right now, which is never would have predicted, especially in this political climate. But I love it. It's like, you know, for everyone to be galvanized over like the fucking meathead in, in, in office uh, and like, you know, all these men going down. Awesome. And these marches and pussy hats and all the shit. Um, but, uh, you know, back in the Lilith Fair days, like that was, people were just sort of I don't know, grew tired of it. So let's see what happens in a couple of years when there's that, that backlash. But hopefully everybody will, you know, like these women will be in power and you don't have to worry about all that shit. Is there anything like going on in your life presently that, that you would like to talk about? What's going on in my life? I mean, I work, I work full time and I have a, I'm a producer on the Late Late Show with James Corden, super fun. I've worked, I, from when Ellen DeGeneres started her talk show, I've worked on all kinds of, well, all these amazing comedians. Like I feel for me, um, realizing there's like a through line in my life of comedy and music, which is, uh, like I said, when the Beastie Boys started, we were like a joke band. We were making fun of hardcore bands and we were like, we were singing songs about, you know, a farm or, or a bodega down the street or, you know, like the most random things. It was all, we were dying laughing, playing, playing all this stuff, pretending to be a hardcore band. And uh, I think that's sort of followed me in life. Like I've always just sort of enjoyed comedy and all that in whatever aspect. Uh, and I love music. I still listen to, I listen to all kinds. I'm not a snob. Some people think you're like a New York music snob. I'm not at all. Like I'll have like the most, like everything going on on my, uh, on my iPhone or whatever. Um, I have a kid who's 12 and he's, Loves music, loves dancing. He li listens to all kinds of stuff, which I think is I feel very proud about. Like he's he's uh, really open, um, and he's very like he's a feminist, and he's like almost wants to be non-binary, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I still love music. I'm probably not as in touch with like new stuff, but I still am very open, and I get excited to see women. Uh, like I said, like even scrolling through my phone on Instagram and I see like Vader drumsticks, like most of their people that they're putting up on, on their Instagram are female players, which is with no comment of like this awesome female percussionist. You know, it's just like this drummer, you know, so I think that's that's very cool. Um, and, I, you know, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, people can still feel creative and make a living. I, I, like I said, I don't understand how people make a living as musicians anymore. I don't quite understand how it works unless you're touring all the time. Um, but because uh, the, the monetizing music sales just doesn't exist. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully Lustrous will continue to play here and there. And we still will stand each other tracks like they'll, uh, which is a very weird modern thing because I can just program them or send them stuff that I've recorded and they just like put it in their magic machine and create music. But that's how we always did music. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll still record and play. Great. Yeah. Um, and then I just have the like, questions that I ask at the end of every interview. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the visibility of women in rock history in general? 
Is there a gender discrepancy? Is it not really an issue? Or has it changed for better or worse? Um, what is my thought of the of women in rock history? So, yeah, not, not historically. like women actively playing, but kind of who gets remembered. So. Hmm. Uh, gosh, that's a hard question. I mean, I think, uh, in general, like for people who aren't necessarily looking past, uh, the CNN, I love the eighties or whatever, like series where they're just going to highlight like the top artists of, of a time. Um, I think you do miss out on a lot of the female innovators or players or people who were like behind the scenes or like, uh, you know, played bass in the, uh, what's that woman who played bass in, in the, the, the band that backed up everybody in the 60s? What's her oh, name? Carol. Oh, Carol Kay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like people like that. Uh, um, but uh, the good news is that if you do want to go down a rabbit hole learning about people that you might not ever read about in Rolling Stone, there's the internet, which is incredible. So that's not something I grew up with. I mean, I was lucky to be in New York where there's record stores where I could walk in and hear like the raincoats or x-ray specs and be like, what is this? Who's this girl singing? What is this? And then see a magazine or a fanzine and like learn about stuff that way. But nowadays you can just tell someone, oh yeah, Google x-ray specs. And then you go on there and you see like all these fucking amazing performances from, I never saw these until last year of, of them on like, uh, TV shows on in England and stuff when when uh, Polly Steinman was 15, you know. So uh, I think that the internet has opened up a whole world of. And if you're interested and you're curious, you'll find out all this cool stuff about people you never knew about women. Um, so hopefully that's uh, that's the key of getting getting things out there uh, and websites and groups that you're interested in can belong to online or or so forth and so on. But I don't know. Is there a big historical art history? Like, you know, there's, if, you, if you take art history, there's a book called The History of Art, which is like this thick, which I think maybe has like two female artists in it, like something crazy, and it probably has been updated since. But I remember being in these art history classes like, really? You only have Louise Bourgeois in this? Like, this, that's it? That's it? That, this, this many pages and that's, that's it? So I think obviously things have changed. So it's, it's, I see a positive change. Yeah, I get really mad when younger people aren't familiar with, <laughs> with musicians that I think they should have at least heard about. Because I'm like, you have the internet now. Yeah. All you have to do is just like type something in Google. Back in my day. <laughs> yeah, it really go, go find, look like, for it. Find a book at a bookstore, like order a book at a bookstore from an old lady who was just like, what's punk rock? <laughs> <laughs> I like, I mean, even now that like, there are bands that, you know, you kind of found your, your group and people and then... You'd hear about, oh, there was a band called Ut, like whatever, like bands, and you never could hear them or see them or know anything. But now I'm like, oh, yeah, I should check them out. So like 30, 40 years later, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what they were about or whatever. Um, how do you feel about your role and in, in contribution to rock history? Uh, how do I feel? Uh, uh I, I don't know. Like, I, I think when I was uh, an active touring musician and I'd meet uh, people who were excited to meet because I had influenced them or, or uh, them seeing me was like the thing, the impetus for them to pick up the sticks or that kind of thing. It's super exciting. And, it, uh, um, you know, I like that I was able to be able, I was able to do like uh, some features in, in the very straight drum world, you know, drum magazines, that kind of thing. Uh, I, like I said, my band wasn't huge, so I don't know that I have the staying power or, or as, uh, uh, or, or, you know, um, maybe more of a footnote than, than uh, some people. I don't know. I don't, I don't have the perspective to know. <laughs> uh, but I hope, yeah, I hope people see, saw me or see me and, and just see that I, I can play and I'm not using any kind of gimmicks and I uh, do my work and I practice and I try my best and, you know, play, uh, um, like I said, try not to be a music snob and learn all about different kinds of music and, you know, play well to a click. <laughs> Too humble, Kate Shalom, Too humble. Someone told me, uh, this friend of mine who records me every once in a while, uh, 
he was say I would say that the things I learned playing with Lester Jackson was like how to play to a click, which I don't know if you've ever if you do that. It's a hard thing to do or to a loop. Um, but I learned early on, and my drum teacher was she was like, if you play if you're playing and you don't hear it, that means you're playing with the click. Like if you start to not hear it, and um, that's I was like, okay, I really learned how to do that. Like I can, and so and also play it at, at like a, when you're recording, you want things to be sort of the same levels always, so you're not like blowing out. So those are the things I learned how to do really well being in this band. <laughs> so even now when I record, uh, my friends is like, you know, I look at the levels and you're just always like, da 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 da. I was oh, like, wow. and you're like on the click. It's Great. Another drummer for your band. But how do you feel about the like gendered categories, like the category, you know, women of rock or the title of this project, for for instance? Um, are we at a point where? We're past all that. Is it still necessary? I think it. Way? Yeah, I, it's a good question. I think it. I think it's still necessary. Yeah, I, th I still think it's important because there's still like even in in, in the industry that I'm in, in television and in, uh, motion pictures and all that. It's still yes, you still need um, the categories to to be female directors or whatever, just because it's still not uh, there's not a parity there between the sexes. So. I still think it takes seeing somebody. Like for me, I had to see Laura play drums for the student teachers and then see the raincoats and see the slits and see ESG and see X-ray specs. Those are the people I needed to see, or the women I needed to see in order to get it in my brain that, oh, I could, I could do this maybe. So I still think that people, girls and women need to see other women. Um, and you know, yeah, maybe in like 10 years, 15 years, it won't be, but I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's necessary. I think it's a good thing. No, I feel exactly the same way. Clearly. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, and I feel the same way too, that like maybe in 15 years, like I won't have to call it this anymore. But I just feel like until you sort of, just taking away the label doesn't uh, really fix like the underlying issues, you know what I mean? There used to this point be a point of view with women and bands uh, that would get mad if they were put on a, there would be something called a pussy package. I don't know if you ever heard that term before, where they'd have like ladies night. It was kind of like a ladies night where they'd put all these bands with like girls or whatever on one bill, even though they had nothing to do with each other, sonically or crowd whatever. And it you could tell when it wasn't quite right. But then there were things like Lilith Fair, and I think even when Lilith started, people were kind of like, oh, it's really like singer songwriter and it's kind of corny and blah, blah, blah. And I think we even had Luscious, when we first were approached to do it, we just sort of like, I don't know, it seems very of a particular type that's not us. Um, but then it, it they opened up the, or and, and basically we talked to Sarah McLaughlin about it. She's like, we're going out to everybody. We're going out to hip hop artists. We're going out to rock bands. We're going out, to, but people aren't, the only people who are saying yes are the same types of like singer songwriters because of Sarah's music. But when, uh, once that sort of became established and all these different kind of musicians were playing on the same bill, uh, and it was such a powerful and an amazing experience, we kind of got to the other side of that and we're like, we don't have to be snobs about, yeah, we can share a bill with the Indigo Girls and Shonen Knife and, uh, I don't know, Missy Elliott and Bonnie Raitt. Like, it's fucking awesome, like, to see all these incredible mus women uh, play players and bands and... Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, well, it's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, is there anything that I didn't ask you about or left out that uh, you would like to add? Uh, I will say that one, one, one of my first favorite bands was Blondie. Uh, it was probably the first band that uh, opened my eyes to the fact that there was this music scene in New York that was very that was happening very close by to where I lived. Um, even though that Blondie was like a few years before I was around, but the clubs that Blondie played at, um, CBGBs and Maxes and all these places were still active. So seeing seeing Blondie and Debbie Harry and all that kind of like really uh, got me in touch with the music scene in New York. And as a little girl, I, you know, was starting to play drums and that kind of thing. I had a fantasy of like, maybe one day, you know, my, the t typical teenage fantasy, like you're at a show and like the drummer breaks their arm and who knows the songs? Who can come up here and play with us? So cut to 
like 20 years later, I get a phone call from Debbie Harry saying, we're playing a show and, and Clem can't do it. Can you sit in? We're just doing this one special show. Uh, that was like the teenage dream come true. So that's like one of my proudest moments is I got to sit in and play a show with Blondie in New York for the Intel Music Fest, which was like something, like a show that Joey and Ramon was throwing together. And um, I got to play like five songs or five or six songs with, with Blondie. I got to be Clem Burke for a day, which was awesome for a night. And uh, getting to like practice with, with Blondie, like my first ever favorite band with that fantasy and then play a show, that was like the coolest thing ever. So that's, that's, my, that's my favorite thing that I got to do. Wow, well, I didn't know that. I'm yeah. really glad that you said that. <laughs> And I feel like I'm a little bit closer to Debbie here, <laughs> to her publicist even responding to one of my emails. I keep interviewing like all of her friends and people that know. Oh her yeah, like Guy and stuff. Yep. Um, yeah, getting a phone call from on my home phone, like pre cell phone. Hi kids, this is Debbie Harry. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> she got my number from Theo from the Lunatics, the singer from the oh, Lunatics. Oh my god, it's so. But crazy. she was a fan. She was a fan of Luscious. She had seen us play, and then. I had done, I was doing this thing every once, every couple of months, uh, there was a night in, at this gay bar in, in New York called Meow Mix and they would, what the fuck was it called? Fraggle Rock, where they would have an all female version of a band doing covers of, of a specific band. So I had done like Hole, in fact, one night and we did like Journey, we did Queen, we, uh, we did uh, uh, Heart, we did Blondie. So um, Theo from the Lunatic Chicks sang for the Blondie cover night and uh debbie came with who did she come with she might have come with chris but they were there so she called me and she was like i know you know the songs like i saw you play them <laughs> so anyway <laughs> that's how that happened and then we got her to sing on a, on a song a luscious jackson song so that was wait what song did she sing on she sang on a song uh on our last record called the song is called fantastic fabulous oh okay yeah you can you can really yeah she does like a whole intro to it it's pretty awesome yeah, that's a full circle life moment. Yeah, totally. Right As they say, full circle.